Okay, we are at the top of the hour and three after. So I want to welcome each of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation Stride Series presented to you by the Standing Together for Research, Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Stride. We bring you a series of four forums with our aim being to advance our occupational therapy research community's understanding and awareness of approaches, ideas that advance equity in research. For this forum, we will be discussing equity in research, setting the stage for ethical collaboration. I'm Dr. Douglene Jackson, AOTF's board secretary, as well as assistant professor at University of Miami. And I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Kalila Johnson, Dr. Barbara Kornblau, and Dr. Zach Marshall. I'll now invite each of our panelists to provide a brief introduction and share a little bit about themselves and their research. So let's start with Dr. Johnson. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, um, AOTF and Douglas Jackson and the rest of the Stride Committee for an invitation to share with you all this evening. Again, I'm Dr. Kalia Johnson. I am an assistant professor in the Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm also an occupational therapy practitioner. I've been an OT now 17 years. It still feels very strange to say that. Um, my work centers uh, minoritized adults with intellectual developmental disabilities um, around health equity and health services research and also doing some work in vocational services, um, primarily um, in North Carolina, but also the entire Eastern Corridor. And so I will punt it over to Dr. Gorblau. I'm Barbara Kornblau, and um, if I lose you, I apologize, but um, we have no power. <laughs> um, and we live, I live in the DC Metro, the power's out. I have all kinds of devices here that give me the ability to be on this call. Anyway, um, I am an occupational therapist and an attorney. Um, I have used my knowledge in both areas to practice both throughout the years. Um, currently, I took a semi-retirement position at Idaho State University. Um, I didn't have to move, um, and I am the program director there, so i um, having kind of fun uh, working from a distance. Um, I, my research has been in the area of policy, and mostly disability policy and policy for underserved, uh, underrepresented communities. I do a lot of work with autistic adults um, because um, I have two sons who are autistic. I have two brothers who are autistic. And, uh, you know, when you grow up as a professional and people say, this is autism, and you know it's not, you have to do something about it. So I've been doing a lot of advocacy for um, autistic adults. Thank you. I'll turn over to Dr. Marshall. Hello, everyone. It's great to meet you. My name is Zach Marshall. I'm based in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. And I recently joined the uh, Department of Community Health Sciences here in our program, uh, which is focused on community rehab and disability studies. And I'm also um, an adjunct professor with the School of Social Work at McGill. So I am coming to you as us with my social work background, which when I talked to Dr. Jackson, I was like, how did I come to this event? But I'm so happy to be with you and to have this conversation today. Um, a lot of my research focuses on research processes and research ethics. I've been a community-based um, researcher for a long time and I started to get interested in understanding how we do, you know, how we practice our research and how we understand it. So it's kind of like research about research um, and I'm also really interested in labor practices within community-based research, how we treat the people that we hire and engage with um, as peer researchers, sometimes called peer researchers, peer workers. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you all for being part of this panel. And as we get started, I want to review our objectives for this specific forum. And our aim is to describe models for collaborative research approaches, discuss fundamental concepts for equity in research, identify ethical considerations for promoting equity in research, and provide some examples of collaborative community partnerships in research. We'll touch on each of these as we navigate our conversation and also provide time for you, our attendees, 
to have discussion in small groups and ask questions of our panelists. So let's get started. We often hear about collaboration in research and that key among colleagues interprofessionally with the community and organizations or individuals who have a wealth of knowledge to share through their lived experiences. You may hear someone refer to themselves as a community action researcher in terms or other terms like community-based participatory research, health services research, and even emancipatory research used to describe such work. So I want to find out from our panelists, what best practice theories or frameworks do you draw from when engaged in collaborative research? So we'll start with you, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that is an excellent um, point about sort of what area of action research do we identify with? Um, and even as someone who is currently sort of doing a critical participatory action research project, um, it took me a long time to really sort of own the identity as an action researcher. Um, it probably wasn't until I became a mentee of Dr. Teo Benavides, who I believe is on the call, um, that I really started to see myself in that way. So this, this is a question I very much um, appreciate. Um, and so the uh, sort of already alluded to critical PAR as a collaborative approach um, that I primarily use in, in my work with minoritized adults with IDD, um, because it, it gives me the ability to name, frame, and also transform contextual factors. But sort of all of the components in PAR uh, gives us the tools and the language to be able to do that. And so PAR are coupled with the Anderson and Davidson uh, model of health service use, um, which allows us to look at sort of what are the individual and contextual factors that influence health behaviors and outcomes. Like those things aligned together are really the frameworks that I use to better understand how Black, Brown, Asian, and Indigenous um, and other uh, folks who identify as minoritized and also have intellectual or developmental disability are able to engage and participate in health services of all kinds. So not just occupational therapy, but anything that is through our more institutionalized medical services, but also in the community. Um, so those two, two frameworks are, the, are those that I draw from. Thank you. Dr. Marshall, how about you? I was very inspired by this question. I started like scribbling down all these thoughts about it. So um, I think for me, probably one of the one of the main um, frameworks is the First Nations principles of OCAP. Um, and OCAP uh, stands for ownership, control, access, and possession. So that's who's actually, you know, holding. Uh, the information and the data that is gathered with communities and what happens to it after it's been collected. Um, so those principles have been really meaningful to me. Um, a couple of other uh, frameworks that stood out are we developed through the Canadian Professional Association for Trans Health. We set about to develop some ethical guidelines uh, over the course of a four-year period, we we did tons of consultation with people, um, and so we were finally able to publish those in English and French, and they include um, a series of questions as well as identify you know why there was a need and some of the uh, certain values and principles that we had in mind when we were uh, developing those guidelines. So that was a really um, collaborative process and something that I really appreciated just to try to get people thinking, especially when they're first maybe designing a project with trans people and for myself being also a part of the community, it felt important that community members were actively involved in the development of those guidelines. Um, two other things I would mention, I don't know if you've seen the report um, that is called, um, just getting the full title for you, Nothing About Us Without Us. Um, the subtitle is Greater and Meaningful Involvement of People Who Use Illegal Drugs. And I know that Nothing About Us Without Us comes from the disability movement um, and was then um, used within the development of some guidelines around how to partner uh, with people who use drugs. And I found it for me, that was a really inspiring document uh, because it was so almost like outspoken and it was a great role model for me. And, and also in that vein, um, 
because I come partly from the world of HIV work, um, GIPA and MIPA principles have been really dominant in our field for many years. So it's what started as the uh, greater involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS and then has um, evolved into considerations of meaningful engagement. So those are just a few, but there's definitely some great examples out there, especially related to um, specific communities and populations. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all, all of those, Dr. Marshall. And we will have a page where our panelists as well as everyone else can drop a lot of resources. So we'll get to that later on in here, but thank you for sharing all of those frameworks. Some I was familiar with, so this is definitely a great learning opportunity for everyone here, even from a good perspective. Um, Dr. Kornbla, how about you? What um, best practice theories or frameworks do you draw upon in your research? I use a lot of community-based participatory research. I have a team of um, autistic adult researchers. Um, one of them is uh, Dr. Scott Robertson. He started, he was one of the co-founders of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Um, Bill Wong, Dr. Bill Wong, who's an occupational therapist who is autistic, um, and the, the couple of the other people, I don't know if they want their names out, so I'm not going to say them, but one of them is um, an attorney, uh, and um, they've both been, or the three of them have been very, very helpful um, in teaching my students in our research class as a team member that they're just like everyone else. Um, and they, you know, they, they can accomplish as much as everybody else can. Um, you know, Scott Robertson has a PhD. He works for the federal government. He's a GS 14 or 15, whatever the highest number is before you get to be appointed by the president. Um, so they're, they are seeing how people who are autistic are just like everybody else um, and can accomplish, you know, all kinds of things. So they're learning how people, autistic people deal with the world. Um, how they cope. They're learning a lot about nothing about us without us. They're learning about um, disability advocacy. Um, I happen to believe, you know, forgive me for being the lawyer in the room, but I happen to think that um, advocacy is one of the most important things that we can teach our clients as occupational therapists, because there's so much there that um, they can ch we can change the world um, with just some advocacy. And, um, you know, it, it's just uh, an amazing thing, an amazing tool to be able to change the world for our clients without not making a splint and changing their lives, but changing the world for everybody with a disability. Thank you. Yes, we can't go on enough about advocacy and we're all advocates and have to empower those who be engaged as well, too. So thank you for that, Dr. Kornbaugh. I want to shift now to talk about equity. Recently, as more people in academia and other institutions have embraced diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's more intentionality around including equity, especially in research. I'd like us to discuss some fundamental concepts with respect to equity, starting with terminology. So can each first define what equity in research means to you? So I'll start with you, Dr. Kornbaugh. Equity in research means to me giving everybody a shot, including everybody who meets your your um, uh, you know your basic requirements, but not putting anything in the way. Um, and I you know just want to mention a little bit when we're talking about equity in research, um, the Tuskegee study or Tuskegee experiment. It wasn't a study, um, and what happened was they took African American it was all men um, in the South, uh, New York Tuskegee Institute. They were part of it at the time. And um, they were looking. They were looking at um, venereal diseases and and you know all of the the sexual transmitted diseases. And for like I think it was like forty or fifty years, um, they were testing people, finding out they had it, and doing nothing. Not treating them. Not telling them you know use a condom so you don't spread the, you know the disease. Um, and when it was finally exposed. Um, we found out a lot, and that had a major, major, major impact on ethics in research. I mean, I think that that was probably the most disastrous thing that ever happened in research. And because of that, we now have standards. This was in the 70s. And when did the standards for research develop? In the 70s. 
Um, and, you know, it was very unfortunate that this was, you know, African-American men were not allowed, once they knew how to treat it and they had antibiotics and stuff, they just let them die and let them get all kinds of other, you know, situations and other disabilities. So this is some of where the ethics comes from in research, is seeing stupid things like that and cruelty in, in research and saying, we're not going to allow this anymore. Thank you for that historical perspective. Um, let's shift to Dr. Johnson. Yeah, um, similarly to, to what's been shared, um, really you think about equity um, and research practices, it's about centering those needs, concerns, and the values of all of those you brought to your table, right? As a, as a PI of a project, um, it, it is not about what, what I want, but it's about what we um, hope to gain in a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, the other thing is, is that equity research often involves folks from marginalized and oppressed communities, like Dr. Kornblau alluded to. And so one of the other things that equi equitable research practices requires is that we have to examine um, our own backgrounds and biases as we cultivate these relationships and sort of be in constant interrogation of our positionalities. Um, I was actually talking to somebody earlier today about although that I work with a group of black adults with IDD, I am still affiliated with the ivory tower. So yes, they see Kalia, the black researcher that's an occupational therapist, but I'm also all of those things. And I'm down the street at UNC Chapel Hill that has a long history of displacing black people, um, experimenting on black people with IDD as recent as 40 years ago and all of these other things that I can't divorce myself from because I am an employee of the university. So, you know, interrogating those, those other identities that we, that we occupy. Um, and the other thing too is that, you know, equitable research practices requires that we historicize and contextualize those, those challenges facing those communities. So it's not enough that we, we call things out, right? I think in research, we admire problems all the time. That's, that, that's part of the game. But we have to say, why do these things exist? And then there must be some sort of emancipatory action. And so for me, e equity research, if, there, if that emancipatory component is not in it, then you, my friend, are just a tourist in your work. <laughs> um, and actually, one, one more thing, because and Dudley knows this um, about me, the thing about um, sort of the comment you made about this intention for equity work and what's happening in the academy. I think there's intention in naming equity in our work, but we haven't yet become intentional about being equitable in our work. Um, and so I hope in our discussions tonight, we'll, um, I'm starting to dig a lot deeper into what that really means. Um, it's, it's not enough that we, we write the words down, but we really must practice them. Um, as we work with our communities. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's important that we not just write the words, that we operationalize them in the context of our daily practices as researchers. Thank you for that. Dr. Marshall, how about you? What does equity mean for you? Well, I was really resonating with what you're saying, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> the, uh, for me, the piece about who is centered is, is really key you know, who is centered in the development of the projects, who's centered in the team, whose voices, you know, where, where are the people, you know, who are most impacted and who have lived experience within the work we're doing. To me, that's really key, whether that's, um, you know, in the initial identification of the focus of, say, a project, um, but also thinking, and again, as, as Dr. Johnson said, beyond maybe just like one project, but what are the priorities for the communities that we work with? And then how can we have, you know, work together on a longer term strategy that really tries to look at, you know, some of the structural factors and really moves beyond just kind of like small sort of piecemeal projects um, and, and has shares this like long term commitment in the work together. I think these are those are the things that really matter because Sometimes um, I think, you know, we can come to a project as researchers with a particular idea, and, and I've seen this for sure in, in projects where we're working with, say, um, a community of uh, people who use drugs in a certain, um, in a city, and, and that group might already know what their priorities are, and so they might be thinking, okay, well, you've got this idea, we're interested in this, you know, how could we do something together that will be mutually beneficial? 
you know what I mean? And that could potentially lead to longer term change. So if we don't think about that, I think it can become uh, tokenistic. Um, and the other piece around that is I find as researchers, when we, when we think about who we're centering, sometimes we might have maybe you know, a certain community in mind. And then we go and we seek out, you know, a couple of people, you know what I mean, to that represent that community um, that are easier for us maybe to work with, you know what I mean? So people talk a lot about that idea of who are you picking to represent the communities that you work with? Are you the one picking them? Or does the, do the communities actually get to pick the people who are, you know, going to be a part of the projects? Because I find when you work with a community group, um, often the people that the group will pick as kind of like leaders or representatives might not be the first people you would have gone to. And that can also cause a lot of division within communities when we do that, you know what I mean, as researchers, when we don't have a good understanding um, and, and can really lead to a lot of problems. So anyway, just, just some ideas about that. But I really agree on the who's centered. Thank you. Thank you for all of that wealth of information because when we're working with individuals, it's important that we center them and also ask them how they would like to be addressed in our study, right? So terminology is constantly changing, especially as we learn more, have more dialogue and work towards creating belonging in our research practices. We see a shift on person first, identity first, language, inclusion of more terms in the LGBTQIA plus community and even with how certain ethnicities would like to be addressed. So you hear Latino and Latinx. I want to pose to you all, how have you seen terminology change in the work that you are involved in? And what impact does this have on your research? So let's start with you, Dr. Kornblau. OK. Um, when I started out, um, when I was in an occupational therapy school, one of my um, professors suggested that I, I, I said to her, why are we learning teaching people to use telephones if they can't get in a phone booth because they're in a wheelchair? And she said to me, this is in Wisconsin, go to the state capitol and go see Representative Jim Wayner and tell him you want to work for him. So I did. And when I started working for him, I was able to do some amazing things that were just, you know, Wow. So one of the things I did is I looked at language. In those days, um, people who were had intellectual disabilities were called retarded. And depending on your IQ score, you were called an idiot, a moron, or an imbecile. So I didn't like those words. So I said to this, the representative I worked for, can we take those words out of the statute? And he said, that's a great idea. What do you want to replace it with? And I don't remember what I came up with. I think I said, um, you know, it might have been uh, just mental retardation because we're talking about in the 70s. OK, <laughs> so that was better than, you know, to be called retarded was better than being called an idiot or a moron. Um, so we were able to change that. And I learned that I can do stuff like that. Like if I don't like something, I can make a change. And I ended up taking a lot of offensive terms out of the state statutes and found out that like you can do stuff like this. If there's something that's really, you know, you really want to change, you can change it. You just have to figure out how. Um, and, you know, some, some of the things that I've been able to do have been kind of, you know, amazing to me that, um, you know, if you get enough people together, you can make a difference. Um, if we wanted, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, research and we talk about how funding and things like that. And there are ways to get research and funding written into bills so that we can get funded to do certain things. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of figuring out a way to move that into the forefront so that we can do that. Because if we want to do advocacy and we want to do policy advocacy and we want to do advocacy to, to do research, that's the way we have to do it. And that's really, you know, it's, it's not accepting things the way they are, but looking at how can we change things. Thank you. And yes, as you said, there's powers in, power in numbers. Yeah. So let's shift this question now to you, Dr. Marshall. Have you seen terminology change in the work that you do, and how does it impact that? 
<laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Well, as someone who works with um, maybe I'll say sexual and gender minority communities, um, we we definitely have a lot going on in the terminology department. Um, and it and it changes all the time. I think what I find difficult is that this also becomes almost a source of potential kind of like mockery, you know what I mean, or a way to demean our communities as well. You know, you'll hear people say things like, oh, well, like the alphabet super, oh, how many letters do they have to have? You know, like it's sort of like, so it can kind of go in this other direction that becomes extremely negative. So I think what we've tried to do, at least what I've tried to do is as much as possible to keep up to date, you know, with current language. And that involves like consulting with people from a range of generations too, right? Because what might be very popular with one group can be, you know, others can find it really offensive. And so more and more, we've been making sure, say on surveys to test our questions beforehand with smaller groups just to see how does this work for you? How are you feeling about it? We, we were doing um, recently in one project which is called Thriving and it's working with two SLGBTQ university students in Ontario. We tested out a gender expression measure first just to see what people thought because we we're like, do we have this right? We're trying to like help move this forward. We also used some questions that at the time um, to ask about gender, uh, which is the two-step method. But it, but since then, so since we did that survey a few years ago to now, I wouldn't do it the same way because we're now we've really evolved our thinking. We're like, oh no, we shouldn't use two-step method for this kind of a survey. You know, we we get feedback from people. So I think we need to be open to listening um, to what people want to be called. And even like within um, the peer research world, a lot of people hate that term um, or like, don't call me, I don't want to be called a peer. And I don't, I think this is a limiting type of a term. So I always, um, I've been doing interviews recently with folks. So I've just been asking at the start, what would you like to be called? What terms work for you? Um, and Dr. Jackson and I were chatting about this yesterday, though. It's hard to, though, when then you get to publishing or you're writing grants because the funders might be used to seeing the word peer research. So does that mean we should use it and put like a footnote, you know, or when we publish in a journal article, if we know that we want other people to be able to find it, how do we deal with this? You know, so I think we, we're trying to talk about that and the evolution of, of the terminology within the papers. Um, but yes, this is a, certainly, I, I think we have to be flexible and ask people what they would like to, you know, what people would like to be called. Thank you. Thank you. And in the asking, it starts to set that stage for us to work collaboratively with equity. Um, Dr. Johnson, how about you? Yeah, you know, it is, it is not much that I can add to that. I share or uh, echo and re-emphasize, underscore everything that has been said. It's really about asking, listening, and mirroring what your research partners are saying um, and using the language that they prefer you use. Um, but in my, my own work, um, you know, outside of, um, you know, autistic adults with, uh, who also have, you know, co-occurring ID, um, you know, in the just sort of general DD community, um, that that conversation isn't as prominent as you see it in other areas. Um, for for this community, a lot of the conversations I've been involved in is how people are classified, and how you know people have really sort of used IQ pervertedly, right, <laughs> um, to to limit what people are able to access and, and use, um, or institutionalization and sort of how that's been weaponized, um, and not so much about the the identity versus. Um, sort of person first language, but it is definitely something that I am concerned with in part of my work um, on the racial and, and ethnic lines in terms of how people want to be referred to, whether it's Black or African-American, um, Latin A, Latin X, um, Asian or, or Brown, um, which there's lots of controversy around like what, who is Brown and what does that mean and who who which, you know, nationality are you talking about when you say that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, uh, for me, best rule of thumb is you you ask, you listen, and you mirror. Um, and, and so far, it, it has worked in my favor. <laughs> yes, definitely checking in to hear how they would like to be described and how they would like to be addressed. Thank you for that. Now, 
I want to shift towards talking about ethics. Within our respective professions and even in the research room, we all have ethical guidelines and obligation when it comes to the work we engage in. We all know about city, we keep our trainings and things up to date. What ethical considerations do you center in your research, especially for promoting equity? Let's start with Marshall. Oh, this is great. This is a great one. Um, for me, I, I would say two key things are around uh, transparency and accountability. And around transparency, I'm particularly interested in the money um, and, and the budgets and who decides you know, what's in the budget, who decides where the money goes. But not only that, how do we, uh, let's just say you actually develop the budget together in a proposal. Well, what happens then later? You know what I mean? Who decides who gets hired and all those pieces that can often be made invisible, you know, or maybe you get, you know, $400,000, but then you come to the community and you say, okay, we've got $30,000. Where's the rest of the money? You know what I mean? So I think um, being clearer about that can be extremely helpful. I think sometimes two communities might say, you know, I'll, I'm just using communities generically, but your community partners might say, um, okay, you got half a million dollars, like what's going on with it? You know, like, what did you do? Um, so I think the more we can be clear about that, because sometimes you'll be like, well, we hired a coordinator um, for four years. Well, all of a sudden, like that money goes down pretty quickly, right? But if we're not transparent about that, I know we can't necessarily say this person is getting paid exactly this much money. But I think if we talk about that and and, and are clearer about that, to me, that is key. Um, and even where the money is held is another element for me. If we keep the monies only in the universities, what does that say? You know, and who's the person signing off for things? So um, I've, I've been really advocating for that. And, and that's kind of like across the board, people's pay rates, um, like for, for say, quote unquote, peer researchers, honoraria. Um, the accountability piece for me is about who's answerable, you know, and who can you talk to, you know, if there's a problem and, and who, who is actually going to, um, how would you put that, be able to come back to communities and engage with communities when things go well, but also when they do not, and come up with a plan for what to do if things are not going well. Uh, so I think all, all of these parts, um, for me, those are probably two of the most central. Uh, definitely being interested in labor practices. I, I'm certainly interested in budgets. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yes, transparency, accountability, and what that funding is used for and where it goes. It, it really helps to bridge those relationships when that contention comes up about funding. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Yeah, um, I think aligned to the money is who owns the data, right? <laughs> um, and, and dealing with um, the trappings of university IRBs. I think when you are doing um, community-based um, extra research of any kind and you are, um, people's lived experiences are part of your data and you are using that to fund part of your research enterprise, I think there's, there's a lot to be considered in how that information is used because people's experiences belong to them, but we certainly use it as data, right? And so, um, you know, I don't have any clean, clear cut answers for that, except that um, pretty much along every single process from the design to questions to how data is collected and analyzed and disseminated and make sure to include my research partners in that process. Um, and, you know, they allow me to deal with the IRB crap <laughs> um, associated with that. But um, there, there definitely has to be um, some sort of dismantling and rebuilding around IRBs as it pertains to community work and, and using that sort of data and, and <laughs> taking stake and ownership in it when it in fact does, doesn't belong to the university or to me even. Um, that, that is uh, definitely, I think, the, the number one ethical consideration in my work. 
Um, and on a professional note, I think something that has, uh, I've been mulling over here for, for a while, and for a while, I, I do mean a while, several, several months, probably even years, is our, how our OT hour, how we are considering equ equitable research, right, and what we're calling um, equity research, community participatory, whatever it is. Um, and the ethics around naming, because um, it has been very troubling for me um, in the last few conferences I've attended to, um, let's just say, attend presentations that are, are presented as being of the community and in the community when it is, in fact, not that. Um, and so making sure that we call things what they are and not naming them um, uh, equity or inclusive even just for the sake of it sounding right um, because it's it's not just it is violent actually to do that um, and you're mis you're misleading your community but also your funders when you do that um, so that's another ethical consideration I think um, folks in uh, the research world really need to consider from jump so what are you actually doing before you try to enter in these communities to bring them along with you um, in the name of equity work. Thank you. Yes, words matter and how our actions align with what we say we define it by really has to show in our publications and our actions. And thank you for pointing out bringing in the community and your partners from the inception of that research process, right? Not just when it comes to that data collection. Dr. Kornblau, what ethical considerations do you center in your research, especially for promoting equity? Well, especially for promoting equity, I'm very much into community-based participatory research um, and involving um, people who are going to be study subjects in the design of the research, as well as in all um, aspects. And as I mentioned, I do a lot of um, community-based participatory research with my team of um, autistic researchers. Um, and it's not just that you get the perspective of the of autistic people who you are studying, but you also get the perspective of what's out there. And instead of being from uh, you know a, just a, a an academic perspective, you're looking at the world as it really is and how people function in the real world. And a lot of the research that we do, we're not setting up, you know, this group does this, this group does that. We're looking at how do people, how do autistic adults function in the world? So we're looking at what is their, what is reality to them? What do they do from day to day? You know, we it seems like you they publicize you know again they'll do this they don't work they can't do anything and we're looking at people who are autistic adults who have um a daily life uh you know perspective that may be different from my daily life perspective but it's a normal daily life perspective to them and i'm using the word normal on purpose it's a routine what do we talk about in ot we talk about routines so they have routines that may not be the same as our routine but it's their routine and you know when you consider that um you know i i always said to myself what happens to all these kids who these autistic kids um, when they graduate from from high school, like they disappear. <laughs> and now, you know, we're seeing that autism, that's not what happens. We have, you know, there are autistic adults who work with you. They may be someone in your own building. Um, you may think that person's a little odd or a little different. Um, I know a lot of people who are odd or different who don't have any diagnosis. <laughs> I mean, they might have a diagnosis if they went and got evaluated, who knows? But, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think is important for us to look at is how can we help people lead normal lives? What does normal mean? Um, how can they participate in um, the same kind of activities that other people participate in? They may be acting a little differently, but that's their lives. And I think that that's what's really important um, to me in my world with um, dealing with autistic researchers, dealing with um, autistic family members. I have two sons who are autistic. Um, and, you know, the concept of, you know, they say high functioning, low functioning. No, it's how people see the world and how they respond to the world. And I think that's what's really important is the equity involved is everybody's different. 
whether you're autistic or not, everybody's different. And, you know, some people who are not autistic react in, you know, what I would say are stupid ways. They're rude. Um, you know, they may piss you off, excuse my French, um, but they don't have, and they don't have a diagnosis. So it's kind of accepting that people, everybody's different. And that's how we have to look at people. And that's the equity is that everybody's different, whether it's racial, ethnic, religious, or just behavioral, that everybody's different. Thank you for that. Yes, everybody's different. And when we look at equity, it also brings us back to considering how in our research practices, we partner with our communities ethically, we respect each identity and create that mutual benefit as someone said earlier. So I wanna shift now to hear a bit more of your particular research story. So in your introductions, you told us a little bit about some of the research that you engaged in, some of your endeavors. And I wanna to return to that and ask what collaborative community partnerships have you been involved in currently or in the past? And how have you promoted equity in that research? So let's start with Dr. Johnson. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the current because that's easiest. <laughs> um, currently, um, um, collecting data for a critical um, PAR, again, with um, primarily Black adults with intellectual developmental disabilities um, around health service access and utilization in, in North Carolina. Um, and while, um, you know, adults with IDD are centered, they are certainly um, only part of the research partners that, that are part of this work. Um, also partnered with um, the ARC of North Carolina um, yes, thank you for including that participatory action research, um, which uh, it stands for, or PAR, it, it stands for that. And um, also the Medical Society of North Carolina, um, there's the Carolina Institute for Developmental Disabilities, TEACH at UNC, and a host of other organizations, Monarch, you name it. Um, what I tried to do was make sure that I touched in some way um, any organization, either long established or grassroots that engages with people that have intellectual and developmental disabilities in my state. Um, and, and even if they aren't part of those sort of more traditional, for lack of a better term, um, agencies, faith communities, um, and other sort of backdoor channels to, to entering into um, communities of color that have IDD. Because um, historically, they've already been left out of these services, right? And so to, to trust someone that is part of the medical com um, industry complex to, to come in and, and share what it is that they're doing uh, required a lot of work. Um, so these relationships was not something that I started um, in my current grant. These are relationships I established or started establishing when I started my PhD back in 2012. I really don't think I would be able to um, partner with the folks that um, I, I have partnered with if they didn't know me back when. And the fact that I kept in touch, even when I moved to Virginia and coming back to UNC, keeping in touch in the middle of a pandemic saying, I know we're not doing anything right now, but hey, what's going on with y'all? Um, that sort of thing, it, it, it matters. It's important that people know that you know, you didn't just come in for this one thing and then leave. You know, there has to be, um, you know, we have to think longitudinally about um, the kind of work that we're doing with these communities. So because of that, I've been invited then to be in partnership with the ARC of North Carolina for some uh, very large, can't talk about it a whole, whole lot because um, it's still in, in, you know, in the works, but, but big Medicaid related project, right? And so when they were looking for, you know, their own stakeholders to come to the table and say, we got this big thing that we're working on. And, you know, we want people who are in the community. Um, like, I was excited because they thought about me being in the community first, not me being at UNC. Nothing wrong with being at UNC. I, you know, I like being at my institution. But they first identified me as somebody who was in the community. Um, and so that like I said, because it's a, a relationship I have cultivated for years, literally years, um, that they thought to call me. 
Um, likewise, with some faith communities um, that are looking to get, um, you know, parishioners connected to services. It's like here I've proven to be somebody that is, you know, really engaged with the community, has shown that I'm trustworthy with their concerns and advocate and not just, you know, saying like I'm giving voice to, it's like I'm passing the mic, you know, as somebody with resources, I'm saying I provided the platform in the way, here go take it and run with it. So just you know, examples of sort of sort of the, the current work. Um past work um got involved with with some idd related work while i was still practicing full-time um, while i was in georgia there around atlanta again with faith-based communities who had young adults with autism um or autistic adults i'm look i'm going back to the language that was used at the time person first language y'all have graduated ot school in 2006 so <laughs> so socialized that way but anyway um uh being engaged in, in that work that way i can't say that equity was something that i was like intentionally focused on but i think it has always been a thread in the way that i practice occupational therapy um and really i think it's, it was those experiences in those early days in georgia that um really fed my my interest to to do you know i say you know, equity, but it really is justice oriented work um, as as a researcher and really using research to bring about real change um, in the lives of people with IDD. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly could probably go on and on and on, but the really building partnerships with these big, long established organizations that have big pull in the legislature too, legislature too that's why I mentioned the ARC, um, but also faith-based communities, um churches or otherwise that um people have real access to because i say the art but sometimes people don't feel like they always they have access to big organizations like that so really sort of being the bridge between the 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 local grassroots down home folks but also the the big power players um in the state so i'll stop there thank you Dr. Korenbao, can you speak to your research and how you center equity in that practice? Sure. Um, so the research that I do <clears throat> has a lot to do with um, uh, autistic adults and uh, policy that is going to help improve their lives. Um, and so what we've been doing is we've been looking at, you know, the community-based participatory research model where we do have, we have a team of uh, autistic adult researchers and student researchers and we look at um, it, you know things that are important to the autistic community so we might look at something like um, uh, accessibility of uh, voting and why is that have anything to do with autistic adults well I don't know if you remember but be, you know the the pandemic what did they do they made people stand in line in Georgia for hours <laughs> in order to vote um, so are autistic adults going to want to stand in line for hours to vote? No. Who, and who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that. So some of these things, um, uh, you know, we have to look at and see what's the impact of uh, these kinds of things on autistic adults. Um, you know, people like to think about it's all social skills. You know, we have to, they, they don't want to be with other people or whatever. And that's not what we're finding. And we're asking people, you know, what's important to you? What do you want? And the irony is that, um, you know, we're finding that there are autistic adults who they want to work, they want to work with everybody else, and they want people to support them, and they just need a little help. It's kind of like doing a puzzle, putting a puzzle together. They know what they have to do, they just have to figure out what the steps are and how they do it, like the way you put a puzzle together. Um, and they also have to deal with the assumptions that people make about them, that if you're autistic, you know, you're doing this all the time or whatever, and that you don't have the ability to um, do things step by step. And a lot of it is also letting the world know about autism and autistic adults because the world people make assumptions about autistic adults and the assumptions are not helpful um, and the assumptions are not necessarily accurate and a lot of these assumptions again are made by people who grew up at a time when autistic kids were doing this and were in separate classrooms and nobody had expectations for them and that has changed so now it's kind of on the one hand helping autistic adults to reach out 
and be able to do things more um, and to get other, you know, to get the non-autistic people to accept them and, and have that understanding. And it's very interesting because I do a lot of work with policy and I do a lot of work with the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, which was started by Dr. Robertson and Ari Neiman, um, they were in, um, they lived in the New York City uh, metropolitan area and they were seeing um, all of the signs about you know the horrible signs that um, the one group that I won't mention would, was putting up and they really um, objected to those and so they said you know we got to start our own group to show people that you know autistic adults autistic people can do stuff they can accomplish things and so Ari's now Ari um, I think he finished he went back to school at Harvard um, and Scott's got his PhD and I, I mentioned you know the, where he, he works the federal government it's a, one of the highest levels GS 14 or 15 or whatever um, and so a lot of it is letting the world know that these are possibilities that you know, just because you have an autistic child, it doesn't mean they're going to be sitting in the corner or going around in circles. That you can have expectations, and as occupational therapists, we can help them with those expectations. So a lot of what I'm doing is policy to put policy in place so that autistic kids are not separated all the time. So that employers hire autistic adults, and that we can normalize the routines of autistic people to be like everybody else. And that's kind of what I'm trying to put out there. And a lot of, you know, what I see sometimes when I talk to therapists is that they, there aren't necessarily those kinds of opportunities in like school-based therapists are, are told to, do, you know, do this, 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 and this when they want to say they want to do something else to, you know, let the kid be more independent. Well, that's not on the end you know, in the IEP or whatever. For the way I look at doing advocacy, to what autistic adults do or can do. Thank you. Thank you. And that policy piece matters. So our research can inform policy and that's exactly. where that importance and what we do matters. Thank you. Dr. Marshall, how about you? Yes, Dr. Kornblau is reminding me how important it is, you know, that we talk as, as different types of service providers, you know, who might be you know, neurotypical and how we talk and, you know, the stereotypes we might have. So yes, this is just um, reminding me of it. So thank you. The um, main project I'm involved in at the moment is called SHIFT, uh, Working for Change in Participatory Research. And um, we wanted to do a survey with community-based researchers in Canada and, and so we're like, okay, great, let's do a survey. And then we're like, where's the list of uh, community-based researchers in Canada? So we kind of had to take a few steps back. Um, and it's great, it's a national team um, of uh, 17 researchers that includes community organizations and um, community researchers, as well as academic researchers. Um, so we ended up, I'm not gonna go into all the details because I really can go very deep into that <laughs> and I've been told before so let's just say we did come up with a list um, and we we took it from um, who's been funded nationally from our Canadian Institutes of Health Research the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Council and it's kind of fascinating because speaking of terminology people use so many different terms right um, so we did this big survey and we had um, 1,100 people responded and said they were doing some form of participatory research, but we made that really broad. It was kind of like engaging with people outside of academia because we just wanted to start to get a bit of a sense of that, what kind of language they used, who they were engaging, what people were doing in the research process. And then, of course, we asked about employment, which is part of our focus. So were they employing people? What kind of arrangements were they, if people were getting paid, what did it look like? So that's been a really interesting process and we're just starting to analyze that. But I think, you know, when we actually speak with peer researchers or community researchers or community consultants, the different types of terms people use, when we talk with people, they're like, yeah, 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 great survey, fine. But anyway, could we please talk about what's actually going on with our employment experiences? Because now you have this big survey and you can tell us this, but we actually need some change. Um, so now we've been really trying to think about what does action look like in this type of work? 
you know, what are we going to do beyond kind of like uh, trying to understand something better? And we're really leaning towards um, looking at what are the um, what are the modes of organizing as workers? So would it be a good idea to start a worker co-op, say with peer researchers? Or should we start some social enterprises um, and actually then be able to engage as organizations with the universities around these employment elements? Because for so many people that work on our work with our projects and on our projects, the employment is very precarious, right? And it's it, COVID has really exacerbated that. Um, and in in the survey, many people were engaging with um, community members as people who are self-employed. So they're basically like submitting invoices for their hours. They're not getting, you know, they have no employment stability. They have no benefits. You know what I mean? They have, there a lot of folks are, yes, they're making income, but the conditions of their work uh, are problematic. So yeah, so we've been really exploring the idea of, okay, could we do create a one or two social enterprises and then think about those social enterprises as health interventions? And there's some great folks um, out of uh, Scotland who've been talking about social enterprises and many of you, you might already know this, but social enterprises as health interventions. So we're thinking about that right now and sort of maybe moving away so much from surveys to trying to do some more action in solidarity um, with communities. So that's one thing. And I also won't talk about a bunch of projects, but the other thing I wanted to say is thinking about what access to opportunities we have um, because I don't know how many of you are invited to say review grants um, you know what I mean and go on grant panels but there's a place where you know we can bring an equity lens to decisions about who gets funded right and which projects actually go ahead um, so that's one thing I really think about the other is about um, mentorship trainees grad students so if we look around us and we're saying like, oh, we'd really like to partner with someone, you know, you know, who who's able to bring this experience, right? Uh, but they're not like in the university, then what are we doing? You know what I mean? If people want to be in the universities, like how can we really think about equity in relation to who we're mentoring and who are the trainees and who are the graduate students that we're really um, investing in while they're also investing in us. So to me, those are some really key priorities that are very much related to this. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And for bringing in that training and mentoring piece, because it's critical that we get the next generation ready to continue this work because not everyone's passionate about research like many of us on here are. So yes, definitely. We've got to get that bug planted and, and get them the skills and tools and resources they need to continue the work. Speaking of that, there were two questions in the chat that I want to pose to our panelists. And then we're going to have everyone going to breakout rooms for a little bit to have their own little discussion. One of them stems around students. So as someone who will be teaching research to entry level MSOT students this academic year for the first time, do you have any suggestions or strategies on how to convey these powerful principles to students and fellow researchers? Any of you feel free to unmute and answer them. Um, I'm happy to kick us off. I think um, one of the most important things we can do as educators um, is to not treat the principles we're talking about is something that is specific to action research or participatory research, that this should be principle for research period um, as sort of, you know, providing that umbrella um, of principles to to guide our students in their in their thinking and development of questions and exploration to keep all of these things in mind. So, you know, while we might have very, if you teach like me, I like sort of meet mod jewels on things um and so I, I i think it's a disservice to to sort of say like these principles belong over here when really it's something we should be thinking about in for research in general i hope that's helpful can i add yes go ahead dr marshall um 
I'm really excited by this because I was teaching research methods for the last few years and we've really struggled with it. Sometimes, you know, social workers will tell us like, this is not really my favorite course. You know, like, why do we have to learn this? Um, what is it for? Where, why will it be useful to me? And um, I was really fortunate to, to co-teach our research methods course for the MSW students last year at McGill with Dr. Regine DeVos. And we found this book called, um, you might've heard of it, There's Something in the Water. Um, the subtitle is Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities. And it was written by uh, Dr. Ingrid Waldron, who's a nursing professor uh, now at McMaster. And it's a, it's a short book, but the book is all about this community-based research project and what happened and the great all the great additional thing is there's a documentary and they did all these uh, amazing knowledge mobilization efforts so we use that actually as our textbook for the course and by doing that and we were fortunate dr waldron even came and did a q a with us uh during one of our classes but we were fortunate then that the students i think could start to see how research can be relevant as a tool you know, in working towards transformation, like social justice and transformation. And so was there a, a chapter on stats? No, but there was a chapter on like, you know, equity in research. And there is a chapter on, you know, how the CBR collaboration worked. Um, and so that's one thing that we did. We tried to find some materials that we felt that students could really maybe engage with, especially students who are bringing a critical lens. Um, and, and I feel really fortunate that, that we were able to do that. Um, and we got great feedback actually uh, from the students for that. Thanks for sharing that. Dr. Kornblau, anything to add? Yeah, I think that one of the most important things that I find in teaching research is um, either letting the students pick their own topics or giving them a group of topics that are of interest that will you know will definitely be of interest to them. So like when we do the community based participatory research with the autistic adults, everybody's like, wow, there are uh, there are autistic people who have PhDs. Oh my gosh. And they're, you know, they're like really learning something new and outside the box. And I find that that's really helpful. And I give them a choice. I give them a bunch of topics and I let them pick things so that they pick things that they're potentially interested in. And that's where I'm finding um, that it's working. Um, so it's not like, okay, you're going to research, you know, how many OTs does it take to change a light bulb? Um, it's not that. It's something that is important in your life. It's important in your community. Uh, something that makes a diff is going to make a difference in the world. And that's really where I'm coming from. And I find that that makes a big difference to them. Thank you. And one final question before we get in our breakout room. So let's keep this one brief. There, the question is, why don't we have a strong statement and strategic actions to address the EIM research, like the statement produced by the Australian Occupational Therapy Journal? And how can we advocate for it? Go ahead, Dr. Cornwell. Um, I think that that's something that you can bring up in the RA, the Representative Assembly, that this is a priority that we would like to promote. Um, and, you know, you have your, a voice there, and I think it makes sense to bring it up there. I think the other thing that makes sense is for faculty to um, bring it up as well. Um, as a priority um, for, you know, if there's, if, I don't know that AOT has a strategic plan, they should, but I think that um, making that a priority in that way, writing an article on it, um, and I would not recommend an article on AJOT on this topic because nobody gets AJOT anymore, but I would recommend something in OT practice talking about why you should be involved in research and why it's important to our profession because everybody still gets in theory i mean you can say you won't you don't want it and you can get it online but in theory everybody still gets ot practice and i think that's really what we need to be doing is promoting it that way thank you anyone else like to add to this all right well we are going to shift gears and allow you all to have some dialogue with each other but before we do that, I want to give you a quick tutorial on Jamboard. 
and we'll drop it in the chat. So you'll be going to breakout rooms and I've prepared a Jamboard to help get your conversation going. So hopefully you're seeing my screen and we have some questions here. What research are you currently involved in or would like to be? What ethical considerations or challenges do you face with your research? And how do you incorporate equity in your research practices? So once you get on this link, you'll click and whatever your group number is, I invite you to use this to have your notes taken as to your discussion. So you can click on this text box over here and then you can type or you can use sticky notes, keeping in mind that they may stack on top of each other and you just need to move them out the way. So we're going to go to our breakout rooms now. When you see it comes up, please select one and enter and have your dialogue and take some notes on here. So you can navigate to whatever group you're at. And then towards the end, if there are any resources you'd like to share with anyone, please feel free to drop those on the remaining pages. All righty, so let's go to our breakout room. You'll be in there for about 10 minutes and I'll dispatch these questions for you there also. Seeing everyone. Okay, I think everybody should be just about back with us. Welcome back everyone. And I hope you had as much fun as I'm having on this webinar and made the most of your time in your small group rooms discussing how you've been or can set the stage for including equity in your research. If you have any final questions you want to ask, drop them in the chat. We'll see if we can get to them. But we want to take this time right now to make sure we share resources. And we did paste some on the Jamboard. So I'm going to ask our panelists, is there any resources that they feel they would like to share with each of you that they might recommend to help you on your journey to center equity in your research. So let's start with you, Dr. Marshall. Okay, good. I was like, am I muted? I'm, I'm busily typing them away, adding them to the resources page. Um, so definitely there are the ones I mentioned, but there's also um, two others I'll, I'll, I'll bring up. One is through the uh, Community Campus Partnerships for Health. On their website, they have a lot of resources about CBPR, including a page about um, principles of partnering that I find really useful. It kind of breaks down a number of principles involved with equitable partnerships. And the other is more conceptual. I don't know how many of you have heard of the concept of ethical space, um, but an incredible Indigenous um, a practitioner called Willie Ehrman um, has uh, put out some videos on YouTube that talk about the concept of ethical space and what it's like to work with people who are coming um, from a range of worldviews and how to navigate the space in between those worldviews. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like, am I like on such a different, you know, coming at this from such a different perspective? How do I work with people who really don't seem to understand or that I might not be able to understand? And I think in our current climate, that is really important. So I've really appreciated the work um, from Willie Ehrman on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Johnson, any resources, trainings you'd like to recommend? Um, yeah, so I was um, trying attempting to share on Jamboard um, some organizations and, you know, university related ones as well that offer trainings. Um, Research Talk, um, I think it's an excellent one. They offer courses year round. Several of them have a focus on equity, both in qualitative and quantitative methods. So if you have an interest in critical um, quantitative uh, methodologies, they offer trainings on that. Some of them are intensive, so week long trainings as well. Um, the Odom Institute for Research and Social Sciences also offers intensives and workshops that are related to research design and development um, around equ equitable practices in that as well, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, although they do primarily qualitative uh, because it's an institute related social sciences. Um, same with Cornell University, they offer those as well. 
Um, and then the Brown School, I want to mention that one specifically because, at, and it's at WashU in St. Louis, because a lot of theirs are free. Um, whereas Research Talk, Odom, and Cornell, um, a lot of their trainings are paid a lot cheaper than some of our big sort of national organizations, though, but still requires some costs. Um, but the Brown School at, at WashU St. Louis is another one to, to check out. So these schools, they offer trainings year round. You do not have to be affiliated with them to, um, to register. Thank you for that. So you can drop them in the chat and I'll make sure they get on the Jamboard um, so that we can have them to disseminate and post in our resources where we have a repository and I'll create that on our website for AOTF. Um, Dr. Kornbaugh, anything you'd like to add when it comes to resources and trainings? Unmute. Um, just that I think that if you're looking to learn more about um, people with disabilities, et cetera, uh, there are some organizations that are helpful. So AUCD is the American hmm, for, um, I forgot what it's called, the but Social AUCD. For University Centers and Disabilities. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and their website is just AUCD.org. Um, they put on a lot of um, interesting workshops and they're very supportive in uh, research of all kinds. Um, there are some other organizations that are disability based that you might be um, interested in, like the AAPD, the American Association of People with Disabilities. If you're looking to do research on people with disabilities, some of these organizations can be very helpful um, in you know, collaborating. Um, the one I mentioned before, um, the uh, the uh, one for um, uh, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Um, I did a policy brief for them and, and I have um, worked with them uh, with uh, uh, research and, and uh, used some of their resources for um, uh, recruiting uh, subjects, but you have to show them that you're not doing nonsensical stuff that you're you know you're including people you're treating people as equals and stuff like that so those are some of the um some of what i would recommend thank you and finally to wrap things up i want to ask each of you to take a moment to share your final takeaways what is it that you want our attendees and viewers to leave knowing it imprinting on their brains going forward so Dr. Kornblau, I'll give you the floor. I think it's really important that we understand that people with disabilities are people first and that if we want to do research with them, some, you know, community-based participatory research is the ideal. But I also think it's important to partner with people with disabilities in developing your research questions because there may be things if you're interested in doing research that people would you know like you have to do a paper or something if you talk to people with disabilities they may come up with something that they're interested in that would make a lot of sense and and just to give you an example um micah fialka feldman is a he's not so young anymore he's like he i think he hit he passed 30. um he's a uh he has a um, intellectual disabilities and he wanted to go to college so he sued um, he well he went in a special program and he ended up suing them because he wanted to live in the dorms and they said he couldn't go he couldn't live in the dorms because he was retarded I'm using that word on purpose they didn't use it but that's what they were thinking um, and just the idea of I, I wrote a, the brief for him as a lawyer but I wrote it as an OT and the idea of being able to advocate in situations like that where you know how people function because you're an OT and to bring that into the courtroom when someone else is saying well, we don't take people like that 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 advocacy and doing research in those areas can really contribute to changing society as a whole thank you dr marshall thank you i'm really inspired by your series I, I feel like as someone, you know, coming yeah. uh, with social work training, I don't know if I've heard a lot about this, at least not in the Canadian context. And I'm kind of intrigued. Like I'm, and I'm also so impressed that there's so much interest. I was saying like, wow, there's a lot of people here that want to talk about this and have these conversations. So I'm, I think it's, for me, it's partly about um, 
feeling kind of inspired and intrigued that people are interested in this topic. I think the other thing is, um, you know, I think we're talking more and more about lived experience and the lived experience of the people that we work with, but also our lived experience as professionals and being more open about the lived experiences that we might bring. You know, I'm, I'm neurodiverse myself. I don't always talk about it. It depends on the context, but I think that it can really help to destigmatize, um, you know, the work that we do, especially as, you know, allied health or health professionals to be able to also uh, create space for us as professionals to bring our lived experience to our roles as researchers, but also as practitioners. And so, um, yes, I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity today for this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Dr. Johnson, final thoughts. Yeah, thank you all again for um, the invitation to be here this evening. Uh, uh, as well, really enjoyed the conversation and excited to see, um, you know, practitioners and researchers, even students um, who are the call that are interested in this work. Um, uh, to, to echo Dr. Marshall, you know, examining our own histories and backgrounds and biases, um, you know, as we enter in, into that work, um, you know, to, to be intentional when we make our, our commitments to this kind of research and dig deeper into, into our data. Um, another final thought is to recognize that the research process itself affects the communities that that we work with and that researchers have a role in ensuring that that what we do actually benefits the community and not at one time, something that's sustainable and repeatable. Um, the other thing I want to reiterate is to make sure we give our research partners credit in the work. The data are theirs, right? Um, and to guard against any um, implied or explicit assumptions that, you know, what, what is normative, um, particularly in communities of color, you know, really interrogating a, that white is normative standard or any sort of default um, in, in anything that we are engaging in with people. So if nothing else, just be in constant interrogation at every step in everything that we do. Thank you. And on behalf of AOTF Stride Committee, I want to thank each of our panelists, Dr. Kalila Johnson, Dr. Barbara Kornblau, and Dr. Zach Marshall, for being here, sharing their knowledge and expertise as we discuss equity and research, setting the stage for ethical collaboration. This is the first in a series of four forums, and I thank all of our attendees for participating, and be sure to check out our next sessions, and that will be webinar two on September 22nd at 7 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you, AOTF, and have a great evening.